Happy New Year to all of my good friends at Spangdalem. Uh, you cannot believe how many times I've talked about my visit in March of 2013 and all the stories I like to tell, all positive, by the way, about the great things that you're doing at Spangdalem. I looked through my vast wardrobe of clothing this morning to try to decide what to wear for this very uh, prestigious occasion. And uh, it suddenly came to me what would be more appropriate to wear than a couple of garments that I was given at Spangdalem. So I'm wearing the Pitsenbarger School sweatshirt, as you can see. What you cannot see underneath the sweatshirt is my Pitsenbarger ALS t-shirt that you gave me when I was there in March. Uh, so uh, I, I wanted to wear that in, in uh, honor of all of my good friends at, uh, at Spangdalem. Uh, second, congratulations to those who have been selected for promotion to chief. Uh, what a great milestone in your career and one that you can be very proud of. I'd like for you to go back with me in time, if you will, to around March 15th of 1967. I was a senior master sergeant in Karat, uh, Thailand, and I was the uh, senior security uh, police uh, NCO. And I knew that it was time for promotions to chief to be announced. At that time, there was no testing. There were no line numbers. Uh, you were simply selected by a board, and everyone put the rank on on 1 April. I had four years in grade as a senior, and so I was, you know, I thought I might be ripe for uh, promotion to chief. Um, along around the middle of the month, I went to the mailroom to check on my mail, and Chief Browning was coming out of the post office. He was the, the personnel chief, looked like a character out of Dick Tracy. Uh, uh, always had a cigar in his mouth, sort of hunched over. Uh, a tough guy, but uh, yet a heart of gold. So I'm going in the post office. He's coming out, and he said to me, Gaylor, uh, have you bought your new chevrons? And I said, should I be buying new chevrons? And he said, how the hell do you expect me to know? He said, but act surprised when the wing commander tells you. And he got in his truck and left, and I stood there in the doorway thinking, did I just get the word? Is he toying with me? Is he telling me something? I, I'm not sure I even checked my mail because it confused me a bit. I went back to my hooch, and I said, my gosh, uh, some things you don't joke about. I can't imagine him teasing me about a promotion. Well, so I thought the next morning I better be in my finest attire awaiting a call from the wing commander, and uh, nothing happened. And the next day nothing happened, and the third day, and by now I'm somewhat of a basket case. Uh, you know, I, I wish he had not said to me what he said. On the third day, if I recall, the phone rang, and I was summoned to the wing commander's office, uh, Colonel Bill Chairsell. And there were five others there, six of us were told that we had been promoted to chief. And, and, I, and I did act surprised, by the way. I, I acted surprised because I, I had gotten the final word. But I remember the excitement. First, I thought of my family back in Shreveport, Louisiana. And if you haven't already done so, you better make sure that you thank your family, uh, your coworkers, your supervisors, all those who have helped you to be promoted. There's no way that a person can be promoted without the help of many uh, who influenced their career. So I thought of my family back in Shreveport. Well, then I wanted to go to the door of Wing headquarters and announce to the world, I am now a chief, I am a chief. It was just one of the exhilarating moments of my life. I went back to the hooch and I looked in the mirror and I said, hey, chief, you're a chief, you're a chief. You know, I'm a chief. And here it is now, I don't know how many years is that, 47 years later or so, but I still feel I'm a chief. I am a chief. Uh, matter of fact, um, uh, you can put on my tombstone, in no hurry, of course, uh, he was a chief, and that would say it all because uh, I'm very proud of that, and I want you to be proud of that. But you can't just be a chief. I challenge you to be the best chief that you can possibly be. It's more than just sewing on a, a chevron or drawing more pay. It is an absolute responsibility to serve our United States Air Force to the best of your ability. Anything less than that is unacceptable. I still am very proud to be a chief. Uh, 
my grandkids have found out if they call me Chief Grandpa, I write a bigger check. And uh, I, I don't make hamburgers on the grill, I make Chief Burgers. And probably the best is uh, uh, we were given a, a, some friends a tour of our house, and the lady said, oh, this must be the master bedroom. Uh, no, this is the chief master bedroom. This is where the chief sleeps. And so I'm very proud of that. And of course, I want you to be proud of it also. So I left Karat, Thailand with my chief chevron on. By the way, uh, Chief Paul Airy was announced as the first chief master sergeant of the Air Force about the same day I was promoted to chief. And I met Paul Airy at Karat, Thailand in October of 1967. But that's another story for later. Uh, so I came back to Barksdale, Louisiana to teach at the NCO Academy. I was a department chief and I had seven instructors working for me. One of the great experiences of my career. And when you know, in 1970, I was summoned for interview by a three-star general named Dave Jones. He was commander of 2nd Air Force at Barksdale. I had never met the man. Uh, why does he want to interview me? And when I went to see him, he said, I'm looking for an enlisted person to serve on my staff as a sergeant major. We were still using that term, now a command chief, of course. And when you know, he selected me, and I became the sergeant major of 2nd Air Force. Wow. Uh, unfortunately, I had to leave the academy, a job that I enjoyed so much. And, and uh, people would say to me, you're the new sergeant major. And I said, yes, what do you do? I said, I have no idea, but I'm going to find out. I said, that's what chiefs do. Uh, they find out uh, what to do. Well, I think I thought that the general would summon me to his office and sit down and say, okay, here's the game plan. I want you to do this, this, and this. But it never happened. And so after two weeks into the job, I, I was confused and disappointed. I didn't share that with anyone but my wife, Selma. But I said, I don't think I like this job. He won't define what he wants me to do. He, uh, I'm somewhat in the dark. Now, my buddies, oh, it's a great job. I love it. But really, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't enjoying my new position at all. The title was uh, prestigious, but I didn't feel that I was contributing. At that time, General Jones' aide was a, a, a captain named Pete Todd. And um, I went to Captain Todd and I said, Sir, can I talk with you? And he said, Sure, Chief, what's on your mind? Pull up a chair. And I sat down and he said, What can I help you with? And I said, Sir, I'm confused. And he said, About what? And I said, Well, the general selected me and I'm in the job, but I'm not sure what he wants me to do. I'm waiting for instruction, for definition for guidance. And uh, he said, hmm, I see, Chief. He said, let me ask you a question. Why do you think he selected you for the position? I said, well, I, I'd like to think that he believed that I had some talent, some ability, some skill. And he said, you know what? I'll bet you that's exactly why he hired you. And then he thought for a moment and he said, what are you waiting for? I said, what? He said, what are you waiting for? I said, I don't know. And I went back to my office and I said, what am I waiting for? If he has to tell me what to do, he probably selected the wrong person. I'm a chief. What am I waiting for? What a tremendous uh, event in my career. And I sat there at my desk and I thought, I got to get with it, initiative, creativity. And I called Blytheville Air Base, Arkansas, and I said, I want to talk to the senior enlisted person. And a few minutes later, a chief came on the line. Uh, this is Chief Gaylord Barksdale. I'm coming to Blytheville Monday. He said, for what? I said, I have no idea, but I'm coming. Well, he said, we're in the middle of preparing for an inspection. Uh, maybe you didn't hear what I said. I'm coming to Blytheville. And I flew up to Blytheville, and I got there, and I said, get some enlisted people together. I want to talk to them. And the trip went pretty well. I got back to Marksdale. I called Carswell. I said, I'm coming to Carswell. I got, for what? I said, I'm not sure. 
Well, to make a long story short, within six months, man, I was in demand. I was getting invites from all over the place. Uh, chiefs move out. You don't wait for definition. If, if you have to be told, now do this, now take care of that, uh, it shows an absence of initiative and creativity and acceptance of responsibility. And so uh, that's the key word that I think uh, we need to address today is accountability, responsibility. And that is getting things done and not waiting to be, uh, to be directed, but moving out on your own and looking around the organization. What should I be doing? What could I be doing? How do I keep fires from starting? How do I uh, address issues that could come up? How do I anticipate challenges that may not be obvious right now? Anything less than that is not acceptable from a chief master sergeant serving in any career field uh, in the Air Force. You know, there's a saying, read the writing on the wall, read the tea, the tea leaves in the cup. And if you're not seeing the writing on the wall and the tea leaves, uh, you've got your head in the sand. Um, the writing on the wall tells me right now, uh, cut back on resources. And that's going to continue to be a tough issue. I don't see any relief in sight. Sexual harassment and sexual abuse. The writing on the wall is you better uh, address that uh, head on. Uh, cutbacks and a new appraisal system that's coming out and non-volunteering people for recruiters and, and basic training instructors, those are writings on the wall. And I would suggest that you take a look at those issues immediately, if you haven't already, and ask yourself, what should I be doing? What could I be doing to, to address those demanding issues uh, that are very challenging right now? So it should be very exciting for you. It should be an exciting time in your career. You have arrived. You are a chief. You now sleep in the in the chief master bedroom. And uh, so uh, I want you to do that. A great story uh, for sort, sort of my closing. Um, 19, I think it was 1955, maybe, pick a year. And I was a cop. I was a tech sergeant at a base in South Texas. And... Um, uh, at that time, defending the base was the number one issue. We thought that the Russians or somebody was going to invade and we'd have to defend our base. I was actually sent to a school in California on how to defend a base. And so with the training that I had had, I decided we needed three days of field maneuvering. And I arranged with a rancher south of the base, about 50 miles, to use his land to practice base defense, set up some mortars and 57 millimeter recoilless rifles and play, play uh, defending games for a few days. I had an airman work for me named Cooper. How would I describe Cooper? He wasn't a very good airman. He tried hard and I actually liked the kid, but everything he touched turned to bad. And so I decided that Cooper would not be going on maneuvers uh, uh, when we went. Matter of fact, I tried to pump him up. I said, I'm leaving you behind to defend the base. Well, that didn't appease him. I want to go, Sergeant Gator. Please, I want to go. Please, I want to be with my buddies. Okay, Cooper. I'll probably regret this, but uh, yeah, we're moving out Tuesday morning. Have your mess kit. So we drive convoy style, about 15 vehicles down to the maneuver ranch. And uh, we get there, and I said to Cooper, I've given this a lot of thought. I'm going to assign you to the mess sergeant to help prepare food. Under his guidance, you'll be less apt to get in trouble. Cooper said, Sergeant Gaylor, you're going to be proud of me. I said, Cooper, I like you, but I don't recall ever being proud of you. And he said, I, I, I said okay, Cooper, just do what the sergeant tells you. About three hours later, I hear a howl coming from down in the area. And I run out there, and Cooper is doing a dance. He's jumping up and down and wringing his hands and yowling. And I run down there, and what the kid had done, in true Cooper fashion, he had reached in an oven to get a big pot of beans without any mitt or holder. 
And he burned his hands. My gosh, they were ugly. They were red. They were, the skin was gone. And he was in pain. Come with me, Cooper. And we go to the first aid tent, and the Texar medic said, what did he do? I, I don't want to talk about it. Just treat him. And he got a big tube of ointment, and he squeezed it in Cooper's hand. It looked like toothpaste. And then he, he got gauze, and he wrapped both hands. When he finished, Cooper had two great big balls of gauze. Uh, it looked like a pugil stick or boxing glove. And he told Cooper, hold your hands up like this and the blood won't, won't rush to your fingers. And Cooper, uh, Sergeant Gaylor, I'm sorry. I said, Cooper, don't say anything. I said, it wasn't meant to be. Uh, see that orange crate? Yes, sit. Just sit until they can take you back to the base for treatment. Just sit. Okay. So I go back to my tent, and I'd been in the tent about 30 minutes, and I feel behind me a tap on my shoulder. And I could tell it wasn't a finger. It turned out to be an elbow. And I turn around, and here's this pathetic sight, this young man with too big. And I said, Cooper, I told you to sit on the orange crate. What do you want now? And he said, Sergeant Gaylor, I have to go to the bathroom. I'm pausing for effect. I have to go to the bathroom. You know, there's always been the question, what do chiefs do? What do chiefs do? Do they pick? I do that. I don't do that. I, oh, yeah, I'll do that. Uh -uh. No way. Chiefs do whatever has to be done. They don't pick and choose. Chiefs do what has to be done. They demonstrate initiative. They move out. They take action. They get things done. They ward off problems. I've told that story, and I've heard a lot of clever responses. Uh, I'll share some of them with you. Some people are sort of funny. Cooper looks to me like you've got a problem. Oh, I thought that was pretty clever. One of them I always liked was, Cooper, you're going to have to find a way to get a hold of yourself. I always thought that was rather clever. Another one I always liked was, Cooper, that looks like something the first sergeant might be interested in. I've heard all those clever responses, but it doesn't work that way. Chiefs do whatever has to be done, whatever it might be, in whatever situation. I've often uh, thought of Cooper. If I recall, we eventually discharged him for inadaptability. Uh, I don't know. Um, Cooper was from Cleveland, Ohio. I've often wondered, is he living? Whatever happened to him? Because Cooper was very important in my life. He taught me responsibility. After Cooper, I never had a problem. From then on, it was do whatever has to be done. I've often wondered, I can see Cooper sitting at a bar having a cool drink. And a stranger comes and sits by him, and they begin talking. During the course of the conversation, Cooper says, You'll never guess what I got a guy to do for me one time. I've often thought of that. Congratulations, my goodness, what, a, what an event in your career. In the audience tonight is uh, probably my favorite chief select, Sandy Scott. Uh, Sandy was my escort uh, when I came to Spangdalem in March. She was with me every waking hour. Uh, she's a great, uh, she'll be a great chief. She was a great senior and a dear friend. Uh, four or five of my young lions throughout the Air Force made chief. I'm a pretty good judge of character. I can look at someone and tell if they're on the way up. And Melanie Knoll and, and Fred Wetzel and Manny Panero, they're all on the chief list along with Sandy Scott. So the system is working. We're picking the right people. The next move is yours, to be a chief. Uh, not just be a chief, but the best chief you can possibly be. You can influence the future of the Air Force. You can influence uh, the people that work with you and for you in a very positive way by being a mentor, a counselor, a disciplinarian, a, uh, a provider of, of advice. And, and I challenge you to be all those things. Uh, 
maybe someday I'll come back. Uh, Matt Grang's a good friend of mine, command chief. Uh, Colonel F., the wing commander, so impressive. If you're there, sir, I told General Breedlove uh, uh, what a great wing commander you were. And, and uh, I think the vice was moving down to Ramstein. I wish him well. Uh, what a great base. Um, I'm still traveling. I go to Scott Air Force Base next week. I'll still continue to share my message because I believe uh, that we've got a lot of challenges, but we're uh, able to face them in a very positive way. Enjoy the evening. Congratulations. Thank you for letting me be a part of the program. <laughs>